Jesus of Nazareth. Perhaps the most influential person in the history of mankind, believed on by many world religions, his teachings have resonated in the hearts and minds of humanity for two millennia. Though he remains by far the most famous historical figure, his identity has remained the subject of much debate among religious circles for well over a thousand years and continues to this day. Though there exists today billion dollar industries based on his name and legacy, even those who claim to follow him seem unclear about the doctrines and creeds built around him. Many believe Jesus to be a unique man, prophet, and teacher of the good news of God, while others believe that Jesus was and is God himself, and that here, in Bethlehem, is where God was born in human form to experience humanity for himself. This debate has been at the core of epic religious controversies, laid the foundation of entire empires, and was the backdrop for the bloodshed of martyrs. So, who is Jesus? What is he? Or can we even know? This is called the Ishanga bone. Found in the Congo region of Africa by a Belgian explorer, the Ishanga bone represents what most scientists believe to be the earliest record of mathematical communication. It contains groupings of single cuts in the bone that archaeologists agree reflects a mathematical endeavor by their frequency and order. Older than the first language or first word symbols, the idea of one is here. One, the oldest idea. So basic and so fundamental, it is no wonder that the God of Jesus used the idea of one to define himself all throughout the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Most Christians believe that Jesus is God, that Jesus' Father is God, and that the Holy Spirit is God, all while claiming that God is one. Because they are uncomfortable with calling themselves tritheists, more comfortable with being labeled as monotheists, Orthodox Christians and Trinitarians insist that the Hebrew word for one, echad, implies plurality. But is this the case? Echad means one. And that I can't, nor will I, judge what <clears throat> Christians have done or the word echad for the last 2,000 years. They've been rather uh, creative in taking the word one to mean three or multiples of one and so on, but that's, that's not my business. I know what echad means, and if someone wants to call a chair a table, it's a free country. You can call a chair a table all you want, it's still a chair and a chad is still one. That's all I can say. For a point of view much closer to that of the Christian community, we'll go to Atlanta Bible College and gain the perspectives of one of the world's foremost Unitarian experts on the subject, author Sir Anthony Buzzard. I was invited to, to study the scriptures on this issue. I really didn't have a fixed view. I was prepared to think that we could, been, we could have been wrong. As I began to look at the biblical text and the history of this doctrine, it, it appeared there was uh, no smoke without a fire. There was something at stake here of great value. If only because the initial opposition you meet from people who haven't examined this is rather scary. They tend to switch you off immediately. But they haven't really examined this carefully. They have assumed that their leader has learned it correctly in the theological college, but they haven't realized that there may be a, a, an equally proficient clergyman down the street who's saying the opposite, who, who learned the opposite view in another college. Jesus, of course, was a Jew, and I think we as Bible readers need to always remember that. He's working out of his own Jewish heritage, his own Jewish legacy. And the most fundamental thing that a Jew believes about God is that he is one. 
a single individual, a single divine person. And so Jesus then demonstrates that Jewishness to the core. Uh, in answer to your question, what is Jewish monotheism? Well, Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 12, verse 28 and following, he is in, in conversation with a friendly scribe who is checking Jesus out to see if he's straight theologically. And Jesus makes a, a remarkable statement there. He says, the greatest of all the commandments is this. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's the core of Jewish monotheism, unitary monotheism, non-Trinitarian monotheism. The idea of Echad, or one, would have been especially meaningful to Jesus, because to the Jews, the idea of one is central to what is called the Shema. The Shema is shorthand for the Creed of Israel, which can be found in Deuteronomy 6.4 of the Old Testament. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right, the Shema is simply the Hebrew word uh, meaning to hear, and it's the command form of the Hebrew verb, to hear. So it's in Deuteronomy 6, in verses 5, 4 and 5, and also parallel verses close by, I think, in, in Deuteronomy 4, 35, where it says there that God is alone, there's no one beside him. The God of Israel speaks as a unit, as a single individual. The idea that he ever speaks as a triune God is really foreign to the text and foreign to Jesus' thinking. A bit like asking a silly question like, what kind of computer did Paul use? Well, they didn't have computers in those days. What sort of God does the Bible present? They didn't know about the Trinity in the days of Jesus and Paul. It's foreign to that whole environment. The Shema is uh, the central statement of uh, Jewish theology, um, an affirmation of the presence of God uh, from the beginning through our lives, continuing on into the future. Uh, in Jewish tradition, the first sentence a young boy is taught is the Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. When a person dies, according to Jewish tradition, the last sentence he says is this affirmation, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, it's part of every worship service. Uh, it's uh, just an, a central part of our uh, tradition and understandings about God. The Jews are, I think, rightly scared at any departure from the unique unitary monotheistic position of their Tanakh, of their Old Testament. So much so that in that Shema, it's rather interesting, uh, they actually write a couple of letters big there. They, they print them huge to call attention to the fact that you must never lose track of this hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, they write two letters large and those letters happen to spell out the word for witness in Hebrew. So this is a witness now against you if you depart from this. So I think we must respect the Jewish heritage in itself, but much more we must respect as Christians the Jewish heritage of our Jewish Saviour Jesus. And I'm nervous of an anti-Semitic tendency here. Why would we want to depart? from that Jewish creed. If we say we love Jesus, wouldn't we keep his commandments? And isn't his first commandment, listen Israel, don't lose track of the fact that the Lord God is one Lord. Mark chapter 12 verses 48 through 29 reads, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Here we have Jesus affirming the Shema, the Jewish creed of Israel, and we know that the Jews did not believe in a trinity or a three-in-one God as being built into the Shema. Therefore, we can deduct that Jesus himself was not a Trinitarian, but a strictly monotheistic Unitarian, meaning Jesus, like all Jews, would deny that anyone or anything was Almighty God except the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. However, in contrast to the theology of Jesus, most who claim to be followers of Jesus today have abandoned his creed and promoted him to the status of deity, adopting a more modern version of deity that challenges the human identity of Jesus. I can tell you that 
probably nine out of ten, at least nine out of ten, nine hundred out of a thousand people who are sitting in the pews of Orthodox churches who are supposed to understand or are supposed to agree that the Trinitarian position is necessary for salvation, that is agreeing with it, don't even know what it is. But yet, the Trinity is cited as the litmus test for salvation. Now that is a problem. My explanation is rough because I know that it's hard to understand, but I believe the Trinity to be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay. And All you, as one, but not that we can understand that fully. There's a lot of talk about the um, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Some people don't believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are God. That only the Father is God. Do you, how, how do you feel about that? Well, I tell you something. I know this for, in my heart, and no one can change this. Jesus is God. Okay. And God is Jesus. Okay. Because the Lord, Philip said to, said to the Lord, he said, Lord, show us the Father that is sufficient us. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said to him, Philip, have I been with you so long that you know not that I and the Father are one? I and the Father, the Father and me. So, you see, Jesus, he died for our sin. Right. But God came in the form of Jesus and went among his own and they didn't accept him. At the first first page, first chapter of St. John. Me, out of way, I, I feel about it in my spirit and heart that you, no man will ever see God. You're going to see Jesus because the 22nd chapter of Revelation tell you that He's going to be on the throne. Jesus Christ is going to be on the throne of God. And the thing about it, He is Lord. Do you believe that uh, in order to be saved, one has to believe in the Trinity? Ooh, that's tough. Um, I don't think that's something someone has to be faced with as soon as they have salvation. It's one of those things you would have to learn. Okay. All right. Mister, I love God with all my soul and heart and mind. And I'm talking about Jesus. You see, I'm talking about who a lot of people don't see. But you know, when they come down to the side of God, how, how much God loved us so much, until he searched the heavens and the earth and he couldn't find one that he thought was worthy enough to come and die for you and my sin. Okay. So he came himself. <laughs> okay. okay. Huh? Okay. Well, one of the things that they've that that they that the Christians have inherited that was foreign to Jesus is certainly the idea that was foreign to Jesus and to his Jewish background and to the first century context of Palestinian uh, Judaism and uh, Galilean Judaism that he arose from was that that God is more than one person. Certainly the, the Jews were very strict monotheists and, uh, and the indications are in the Gospels that Jesus was a very strict strict monotheist as well. Well, there's been a shift of some sort because I, I would say with many scholars, certainly scholars of the Old Testament, they would say that Judaism was always unitary in its monotheism. That's to say God is one single person divine person, not obviously not human, but divine, capital P, person, if you like, but a single individ individual, the Father. And so that would be Jewish monotheism, uh, and I would argue that Jesus affirmed this with all the passion that he could muster in conversation with the Jew. And what's so clever about that episode in Mark 12 is that Jesus is seen there as agreeing with the Jew. And so if the Jew was not a Trinitarian, then nor was Jesus. Trinitarianism later said, we believe that the oneness of God consists of three persons. So we've shifted from one person to three persons. 
and yet we still call it monotheism. I would question whether it is monotheism on the strict basis of scripture, right? You could argue for creeds from a philosophical background and so on, you could argue that that's one way to describe God as one essence in three persons, but that's not strictly the biblical way of doing it. So the shift is from one person to three persons. And there is a popular Bible teacher who says that God is three persons or three who's in one what. You know the shift there. We've gone to one what instead of one person. That's a considerable shift. All right. The idea of the Trinity. Um, one of the things God's really revealed to me is that we uh, are actually three parts. Uh, God created us as a body, uh, as a soul, but also as a spirit. Um, our soul is actually made up of, of who we are, what we think, and our thoughts and our actions. But our spirit is that part of us that we don't really even understand until we're reborn in, in Jesus Christ. Um, it's why every uh, culture is always desired to understand who God is. It's the part of us we don't understand. Uh, and our spirit actually relates to the part of the Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that's how we can actually relate to God. Um, so we're actually three parts, just as God is three parts. And God has seen fit for His Holy Spirit to interact with our spirit. And that's why when we become uh, saved in Jesus Christ, our spirit can actually relate to God on that level. That's one of the most uh, amazing things that God has actually revealed to me about the importance of not only His Trinity, but also of our Trinity. Yeah. Well, as we all, we all know, Jesus was Jewish, and He was raised in a Jewish temple, and um, He did learn the, the scriptures, He learned and studied the Torah. And so, um, I, th I don't think we should throw out Jewish scripture, that's not where, as Christians, we do believe the Old Testament. and. Um, and we do study it, and, and Jesus was Jewish. And so um, we do understand that the Lord God is one, but we understand that he is three persons, and those three persons are the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I don't know if that answers that well for you, but... It's sort of, yeah, I think it partially does restates the problem. There's clearly an issue of some sort here, because you and I believe in Jesus as our Savior, and we're yes. supposed to listen to what he says. And on the face of it, he's here declaring a Unitarian yeah. creed, which we don't seem to have in our Christian church. So. But we don't have a polytheistic creed. Okay, because you insist it's one. Yeah, yeah. It's not one person, though, is it? It's, no, three, it's three persons, persons in one. And as one God, yes. One God. Can you unpack that word God? We've got three persons. This one's God, 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 and God. But God, Holy one. Spirit, and Jesus. And it makes one. Makes one. God. Yes. One God. So this one is God. This one is God. This one is God. And we're one, as one God. We seem to be in contradiction. One God, three persons. But each person is God. Yes. So we haven't quite made this clear to the public yet. They will still okay. say, you're not making sense. Yes, I know. I know. I know that. I'm sorry I'm not very good at it. You're doing, it. It. You're doing <laughs> absolutely brilliantly well. Then the flow would simply be this. That once you say that the Son is also God, then you're opposing the idea of two gods. And you can only avoid this by an extraordinarily difficult and complex verbal gymnastics. So what happens, and this is the result of those, that flaw, the result is the public is told, it's a mystery. You're not to question that. It's not logical. cannot be reduced to logic. And it must be accepted. It must be somehow apprehended, but not necessarily comprehended. And that's a strange distinction in itself. You're to accept this as a mystery. Rather sinister, I think, in that story is this. Uh, the famous church historian Adolf Harnack says that when this process happened, that they decided that the Son is God, the Father is God, and also the Holy Spirit added, that they're really one God, though three. What happened was this, that the clergy, the educated class, were the only people who supposedly could explain this. This then gave the clergy a superior position. They became the paid professionals, and it put the laity, as Harnack says, under guardians. They were then under restraint. They were uh, under the guardian, the tutorship of the clergy, and they were simply told, this is for us to explain. We understand this. It's highly philosophical, highly technical, but you don't need to understand it. It's a mystery to be accepted. I think that was a very serious uh, development in church history. If you say there's a God the Father who remains in heaven, while another person, God the Son, comes to the earth, which is what Trinitarianism says, are you not positing two gods here? God the Father is not God the Son in Trinitarian theology. And here this God the Father remains in heaven. God the Son walks the earth on Trinitarian theory, that sounds awfully like two gods to me. To deny that he was a human being is to deny his historical evidences. It should be, the burden of proof should be on those who say he isn't a human being.
that he was more than something else other than a human being to to demonstrate that was he a great religious teacher was he did he claim to be a messiah was he recognized as messiah but you see those within jewish context though those, those are very specific categories they, those are not the same as claiming to be god or being recognized as god or anything like that so if one is interested in getting at the real jesus there's every advantage to to investigating the evidence that shows him very much in his biblical context not in his jewish context not as as claiming anything like co-eternal co-existence uh, with the Father, you know, eternal uh, pre-existence, uh, all power, all of those things. Th these are things which were bestowed on him, various parts of these things. You know, like he says, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Um, he is given certain privileges, but all of those powers, privileges, and authorities are what are delegated. Even in the Gospel of John, they're all delegated by God to him. So I think that that was an advantage of, uh, of taking Jesus in a strict exegetical sense from Scripture is that you're likely to get something very much closer to the actual Jesus rather than centuries of tradition about him. don't know that I can explain the Trinity, but uh, my understanding is um, that God is a spirit and he can manifest himself in any way, shape, or form that he would like and he's chosen to do that through his son, Jesus Christ in the flesh to uh, die for the sins of the world and then stand at the right hand of the Father. And then right now the Holy Spirit is doing the active work in the body and on earth currently until the next phase comes. So my best analogy of uh, the Trinity is one that I've heard um, that it is comparable to a father who in his relationship, in one relationship, is a father to his son. He's a son to his father, and he's a husband to his wife. So he's one man manifest in three different relationships, three different ways. Um, but we know and believe that there's only one God. Doctrine and theology is, is all good because the Bible is is deep, it's got depth to it, it's, it's deeper than the ocean, you know, but it's simple too, like my belief system, everything I, I base my entire life off of is, is off what Christ did for me, and he's the, he points me to God. I worship God because of what Christ did for me. Yeah. You yeah. don't sound like a Unitarian thing, so when you say God, you really mean the Father, most I'm, of that. Absolutely, you mean the Father, so it's it's because different. the Father is who, who God, who Christ put me back in the union with, because I, the union was broken, so a Jew, whether they believe in the Trinity or not, mm -hmm. I would still point them to Christ, because in Christ we point them to God, the Father, who they have worshipped, and, and Jesus said himself, he said, you know, you guys worship God, but you actually are sins of the devil, you know, because, mm -hmm. because without going through me, yeah. you cannot get to the Father. So I believe, whether That's it's the tr called the Trinity or whatever, Triunion, or... You're very reasonable, I think, because Christ. there are Christians around who say that if you if you will not say God, if Jesus is absolutely God in the Trinitarian sense, you aren't even saved, you're going to go to hell forever. And we're trying to break down that kind of theory of the doctrine. Well, I mean, I'm very familiar with t traditional Orthodox understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is uh, one essence or one being in three persons, you know, that kind of language is used. But what it amounts to is that evangelicals have found essentially three gods in scripture. They know that the Torah says there's only one God, but they come to the New Testament documents and they find statements that seem to suggest that Jesus is God, and then other statements where the Holy Spirit is God. And so if and Jesus' Father is God, so if there's the Father is God, and then the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, they found three gods. And instead of, I would say, if they were honest, they would have to say, well, the Scripture says there's one God, and the Scripture says there are three gods, or at least we find three gods. And I think that's an unreconcilable difference. So instead of wanting to say, well, the Scriptures contradict itself, somehow we need to find a way to mesh this together into a unified whole. And what they've done is they've manipulated language in order to, to do that and say, well, there's, God, they must share the same essence, they must share the same nature, they must share the same substance. They're essentially uh, one God, 
but just revealed in three different persons. But I think that's misleading because the substance, if they each individually shared three, uh, the same substance, I think they would still be three gods, just as I shared the same human substance as my mother and my father, yet we're three humans. So if Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit share the same God substance, they're three, still three gods. So I don't think that that helps, even though that's the language that's used in order to help people uh, come to peace with the whole uh, apparent contradiction or paradox, as somebody might say. Yeah, yeah. It's 100% man, 100% God. He's 100% man, 100% God. Can you, can you, can you, can you be 200% of anything? Huh? Is it possible to be 200% of anything? Um, Seems strange. I think it's possible for God. I think all things are possible for God. Um, not for us. So when uh, Jesus says he doesn't know the time of the second coming, that's just the God who doesn't know. It seems strange. He said, you know, I don't know when I'm coming back. The son doesn't know. So is he God when he says he doesn't know something? I don't does he really say I don't know, or, or does he say I'm coming like a like a thief in the night, yeah, and not know the time nor the hour? He says that too. Yeah. But there's no text in Matthew in, in the Olivet Discourse where he says, neither, neither the angels nor even the sun knows the day or the hour. Right. If he's God. Why doesn't he know? You think he ought to know it? Oh, I think he was referring to the. I think he was referring to the angels or the suns or man. None of them will know. He knows. He knows. He's, he's eternal. He's the, he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He knows all. Um, so he knows, but I think he's referring to everyone else. You know, you will not know the time nor the hour. And if he's God, can he die? Can God die? Can God die? Um, I believe he has died for us already. And I, I believe he's, he's, he says, uh, it says that, you know, I, he's died once. Um, so... Yeah. God, can, God can die. Yeah. So the God you believe in is actually a mortal God. He's able to die. He has died and he's risen again and he's seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. When we come within Christian doctrines of the Trinity, for example, then we start thinking, who is really Jesus Christ? Is he a God? Is he son of God? Is he one of two? And so on and so forth. So you are introducing a new interpretation that neither Christianity, neither Judaism or Islamic interpretations, which we consider it, it's the last message from God to all mankind. So it's definitive to us that you have to be very clear that God is God, there is none like unto him, by denying any other divinity to anything else. No, I don't believe the disciples or the apostles believed that Jesus was Almighty God. Um, just as Peter said, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Um, he was saying that God made Jesus the sovereign, uh, the Messiah, the King to come. I don't find it acceptable. One of the things is because I have a son myself who is not me. However, I have in the past, from time to time, given him responsibility for me to do things. And because he's had my, I've given him that responsibility to accomplish them, he did them in my uh, place, in my name, if you want to use that word. And so because I gave him the responsibility, then he would do that for me as if I was doing it myself. And if we can't take the concepts we have of God and teach them to children so that the children understand them, then they may not be understandable. They may not make sense. And if they don't make sense, I've been told, that's nonsense. So where did this idea come from? If the idea of a heart is so simple and sure, how did the identity of Jesus become so widely accepted as being divine? The answer begins here. I think what happened was simply this, and, and this can be traced in the second century. It wasn't long after the, the ink on the pages of the New Testament was dry, as Paul warned, the Gentile influx is going to corrupt the faith. 
And in a sense, the New Testament fights that all the time. Those apostles forever hedging the, the, the young faith around to prevent it from being mixed with paganism. What appears to have happened, and you're right to direct me back to that particular point, because this is, this is crucial, there's clearly an influence of pagan philosophy coming in in 150 AD. The church fathers are, are no longer Jews, that's significant. The leadership of the church has passed from Jews, who are unitary monotheists, to pagans who actually believed in pagan philosophy before they became Christians. So much so that they even said that Moses was a kind of Platonist, Justin Martyr in the second century, was trained as a philosopher. Isn't it rather reasonable, uh, not uh, that I'm happy it happened, but isn't it quite natural in a way that these people would impose their previously learned philosophical system on the Bible? And I think that's what happened. The doctrine of the Trinity formally stated is one God, one one God in three persons. Um, God having one essence or being. These are all philosophical terms that have been used, um, drawn from Greek um, terminology. Homo usion, which means being or essence, was the first officially applied to Jesus in a universal sense at the Council of Nicaea that Emperor Constantine called in order to have theological unity between the bishops that that existed in the Roman Empire. He had he had agreed to um, have the bishops come together to discuss this issue. Uh, one essence of God existing in three persons um, won the day and as one emperor after another uh, continued to embrace Christianity and grant ecclesiastical and judicial grant judicial power to the ecclesiastical bodies um, it was easier to enforce one point of view prior to, prior to the Council of Nicaea in 325 um, AD there was a divided empire with regard to the question of the Trinity or um, the oneness of God for instance as presented by um, Arius, who was a, a Christian priest at the time. Um, but there were people primarily in the eastern part of Constantine's empire that were almost exclusively um, Unitarian in their perspective, or at least at least they did not believe Jesus to be God. But I would also be concerned about uh, Constantine's motives. Constantine is known not only for his convening of the council and his attempt to control Christianity, but he's also known as the emperor who gave us Sunday. If Coleman is right, it would seem that what Constantine was trying to do was to create a new cult which would unite Christianity and sun worship. So what Constantine was after, it would seem, was a kind of syncretistic religion in which Christianity had a place, but also uh, sun worship. The, these were the two most powerful religions in the empire, and Constantine was trying to create a syncretistic uh, cult out of the two. But bottom line, after the vote was taken, and the Trinitarian side won, Constantine supported that decision by banishing or sending into exile the uh, Arian opponents. Because I think people felt that the truth was revealed there. The truth was finally settled, the truth won out in those two councils, and to prevent further discussion, the emperor then said, this is it, we're not going to divide on this issue anymore. So. It really has the backing of a pagan system. The Roman emperors were partly responsible under Constantine at the time of the Nicene uh, Council. He was the one who really adjudicated at that council. Not to say that the bishops were not involved in the argumentation. They were. But at the end of the day, he put his stamp on, on what was the majority decision. And that has not been challenged. 
because beyond that time the Roman Catholic Church was the monolithic sole ecclesiastical body really with the Pope as supposedly representing Peter and he simply continued to reinforce this dogma this triune dogma at the time of the Reformation in 1517 AD the principal reformers Calvin in Switzerland and Luther in Germany did not challenge this part of the accepted creed they challenged many other things in the existing ecclesiastical system but this doctrine of God as three persons in the one essence was not challenged by those principal reformers well, I think certainly the biggest misconception that that um, Christians have about Jesus is is they have confused the Jesus who was built up by the later creeds and by tradition, the Christ that was built up by the creeds and tradition with the historical figure that uh, lived in Palestine close to about 2,000 years ago. And in doing that, they've acquired a number of uh, pieces of baggage with, that, with those misconceptions, many of them which have been uh, kind of a a departures from what Jesus himself would have uh, would have thought as a Palestinian Jew, and so forth, and uh, certainly would have departed from from his tradition in many ways. And this is these historians looking at that early church history, the second and the third centuries. They know for well there was no standard. They were milling around arguing these things. It was only later that orthodoxy orthodoxy won the battle and said, "Now we are the triumphant ones. We're the orthodox ones. You join us, or you'll be on the pale." Kind of gang warfare. And the possibility, the, the very threatening and interesting possibility is this, that what became orthodoxy in those creeds was originally heresy. Can you imagine that the situation standing itself on its head? An original orthodoxy, Jesus' right opinion, the apostolic right opinion, uh, given by the creedal statements of the New Testament, for example, there is one God, the Father, and one mediator between that one God and man, the man, Messiah Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. So, regardless of how a Roman emperor oversaw a period of its development, and regardless of how church councils have treated the issue for hundreds of years, how do modern supporters of the Trinity doctrine defend their faith? Surely they must have good reason to demand that Jesus is God, right? Genesis 1.1 reads, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word for God here is Elohim. Elohim is a word used in the Bible oftentimes to describe powerful people. In Exodus chapter 21, Elohim is used to describe powerful judges, and it is also used to describe angels in Psalm chapter 8. We have several names. We have Elohim, we have Adonai, we have written here uh, Shaddai. We have the four-letter word, which we don't know exactly how to pronounce, Yahweh, or some people pronounce it Jehovah. And Elohim is one of the names that's used to refer to God. There is a plural ending, but we don't have any it's it, again it's used by this plural ending is used by um, Christians and others to substantiate their belief that in multiple gods but Judaism just disregards it Elohim is the way that the word is is the way the word all often appears it's like a plural which appears in some of our languages for instance the word news in our language we don't say, I'm going to go watch an item of new. It's an item of news. And it's just its usage which tells you whether it's one item of news or multiple items of news. Well, Elohim is similar. The the, the im ending is is the plural in the Hebrew. And so you there there you have a case where context has to determine whether the pronoun whether yeah is singular or plural. And Queen Elizabeth the second right now the the reigning monarch of, of England uses the phrase, we. She's referring to herself, but all that she represents. But yes, that, that's so. One of the explanations as to Elohim, that it was a majestic way of referring to God. Other people don't accept that. 
Though Genesis 1 presents a less than persuasive proof text for the Trinity, it remains one of the favorite go-to verses for Trinitarians to defend their faith, as does our next example, the famous John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So something is wrong when you read John 1.1 and come up with the Trinity, and Anthony those read it and come up with one God. Now, why is the problem? The problem it has to do with the scholarly folk as they translate it down to the lay people. It's very interesting that most of the so-called proof texts in favor of the Trinity are drawn from one gospel. That in itself is suspect. If the doctrine of God is to be established, it should be established across the pages of Scripture from beginning to end. What in fact happens is that John's gospel is promoted as the only source almost. A few verses in Paul and a couple of others elsewhere. But mainly it's simply just from John's gospel. So that is suspect. But we have to look and see what John is saying. Matthew, Mark and Luke clearly tell us that the Son of God was created in the womb of his mother. No question. Is John really saying something else? I would think it unlikely because John knew what Jesus had taught and Matthew equally well knew what Jesus has taught. Are they really at odds on this whole discussion of who Jesus is? I doubt it. Common sense would dictate in the opposite direction. So in the beginning was the word. does not say in the beginning was the son. A distinguished uh, systematic theologian of our time, Colin, Dr. Colin Brown at Fuller, in an interesting article written in 1991, says the following. To read John 1.1 1, 1, as though it says in the beginning was the Son, is patently wrong. But that's the way Trinitarians are reading it. It doesn't say that. It says in the beginning was the Word. That word, Word, Logos, has occurred in the Old Testament about 1,600 times probably. It never meant a person. One's Word is not a person. It's the expression of one's thought. It's an extension of oneself. So in the beginning God had a thought. It's the word for the Gospel in the New Testament, the Logos. The Word is not just a synonym for the Bible, incidentally. That's the Scriptures. The Bible calls itself the Scriptures. But within the pages of scripture you have this word the saving gospel of the kingdom Matthew 13 19 the logos or word about the kingdom which is Jesus whole career is, is, is as a kingdom missionary preacher so in the beginning was the gospel the logos the plan the blueprint the design and that logos is with God that's a very Hebrew way of saying John is very Hebrew in his ways of thinking though he's writing in Greek that was simply in God's heart it was his project it was with him we don't say that in English. We don't say, my word is with me. But Hebrews do. They say, my plan is what is concerning me. My decree is in my heart. And it was fully expressive of God. It was God. Notice it, as those eight English translations before the King James rightly translated. It was God himself. It was as close to the heart of God as you can possibly get. Now that word then eventually was born as a human being. So it's a transition of not a pre-existing son to a God-man it's the transition of a word a promise a design into embodiment as a human being who was begotten as the second Adam created in the womb of his mother that would be a key a key uh, verse for the Trinitarian point of view but it really doesn't contradict Matthew Mark and Luke much less does it contradict the Old Testament would clearly God created heavens and earth alone no son there at all John's Gospel begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I think that some Christians can't believe their eyes when they read that, because they, they read it as if it had said, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God and the Son was God or worse still in the beginning was Jesus but to say that would be to deny the humanity of Jesus so I prefer to stick with the wording of John's Gospel and that is in the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The, the Logos was eternal. And the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. Trinitarians turn to our third proof text, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, 
sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So that Psalm 110.1 is just fascinating to me because it hangs like an umbrella over the New Testament. It's quoted or alluded to about 25 times. It's a key to New Testament Christology. And we have Yahweh sitting there as the God of Israel. And he speaks in Psalm 110.1 <clears throat> to somebody called my Lord. David calls him my Lord. But that word my Lord is not the word for God. It's the Hebrew word Adoni. And it occurs 195 times in the Old Testament. It never means God. There's another word, Adonai, which your uh, viewers can, can uh, remember because it rhymes with El Shaddai, and people know the song, El Shaddai. So think of Adonai rhyming with El Shaddai. Adonai means the Lord God, 449 times in the Old Testament. It's a substitute word for Yahweh, the Lord God. It's not Yahweh speaking to Adonai. That would be God talking to God, and the universe would collapse. It's Yahweh speaking to the supremely exalted human being. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until make it your enemies your footstool. And this is, of course, cited a number of times, I think about 31 times or alluded to, alluded to and cited about 31 times in the New Testament as applying to Jesus. In other words, what the one Lord is the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, says, and this is supposed to be David speaking here, says to my Lord, Adoni, which is the form, Adoni, it's Lord, my, literally. And, and that term is often used to reply to, to a human superior or an angelic superior, but not to God. Adonai, the long form, is applied to God. In this case, it is Adoni, and for instance, someone may come and say, my Lord, the King, he would use the phrase Adoni. And, uh, and so forth. So this is a, certainly a case which shows that Yahweh, the, the one God of Israel, is addressing David's Lord. And the implication, as understood by, by later commentators, was that this was the Messiah being, being referred to here. And uh, it certainly isn't one part of Yahweh speaking to another hypostasis of Yahweh or any of those sorts of things, even though a number of, of uh, dictionaries and translations have gotten this wrong, actually when it is pointed out to a number of them, they have gone, to some of them they have gone and changed it. Anthony Buzzard has talked about that and written about that before. Mm. I, I think you see the logical implication of this. The Bible is a story about God and man, and this then is the story of the amazing thing that God has been able to do with a fully submitted man. The perfect son, who is always obedient to the Father, right? Now he's the model for us. Not that we're going to be quite at Jesus' level, but we better come somewhere near, <laughs> because we're his followers. So this is the glorious story of what God, in his infinite wisdom and power and plan, has been able to do with a created human being, the Son of God. And as our wonderful uh, professor of theology here, Fuller, is saying in a, in a distinguished article, to be called Son of God in the Bible means you are not God. We're making progress now towards a proper biblical definition of the Son of God, not God the Son. Another common proof text reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. 1 John 5, 7 appears in the King James Bible. It speaks of the Word and the Spirit. And the Son, not the, not the Son actually, I think the Word and the Spirit and the Father as one, all agreeing in one. It's a blatant forgery, and this is well known by every scholar. Every uh, form of Bible notes today will tell you that this text is not part of the original Greek text. It's a forgery. I have to tell you it's a forgery in, invented to promote the Trinitarian idea, probably. It doesn't exist in the manuscripts. It's not found in any manuscript until much, much later than the manuscripts which we have. It, it originally appeared in the margin of some Latin copies. And at the time of the Reformation, when they were producing the English Bible, Erasmus was challenged uh, to the effect that if, if one could find one extant manuscript that had it, then he agreed to have it in there. Well, somebody produced an Irish manuscript, I think, of the 1500s or something, and he was forced to put it in there. It's been rightly omitted from all modern translations. It's a forgery. It's a fraud. It doesn't belong in Scripture and cannot be argued 
by anyone in favor of the Trinity. There's another one that is suspect in King James in 1 Timothy 3.16. It says, God was manifested in the flesh. Modern versions have corrected that also. The better manuscripts state simply, he who was manifest in the flesh. It doesn't say God was manifested in the flesh. And there are a number of other occasions where there's an ambiguity in the Greek where Trinitarians tend to push in favor of Jesus being called God where it's entirely ambiguous. The fact is that God is called the Father, the Father is called God, over 1,300 times in the New Testament. Jesus is referred to as God in, in a secondary sense, remembering that the judges could also be called God. Moses was called God in the Old Testament. So on a very rare occasion, Jesus can be called God twice, actually, for certain. Only twice for certain. That should not outweigh or equalize the evidence of 1,300 occurrences of God, plainly meaning the Father of Jesus. But it should be mentioned that Jesus has a God in the New Testament. God the Father is said to be the God of Jesus. Indeed, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's incredible. You can't be co-equal with the one who is your God. That's just nonsense. So there are not two gods. There's only one God, and Jesus is the Lord Messiah. He's the Son of God, virginally born, virginally begotten by miracle. Another popular proof text is John chapter 10, verse 30 which reads, I and the Father are one. John 10.30 was used for many years by Trinitarians to establish the idea of a oneness, uh, what theologians call an ontological oneness. They're one in essence. They're both co-equal, co-eternal, co-essential God. The text reads, I and the Father are one. The problem with that is simply that Jesus later says that the disciples are to be one in the same sense that he and the Father are one. That's found in John 17, 11, and I think 22. That must prove then that it's nothing to do with co-eternal, co-essential relationships in the Godhead. Because if it were, then the disciples would equally be God, and that's nonsense. Simply, Jesus and the Father are one means that they are in, totally in harmony, hand in glove. Hand in glove in terms of character and, above all, words and message. That doesn't prove that Jesus is God. What it does prove is that God was in Christ, working through him. It doesn't say that God was Christ. It says that God was in Christ. He's the vehicle, the agent, as the Hebrews say, the shaliach, the one sent to declare the Father's heart and will. So the words of the Father and the power of the Father are exemplified in this human being. That, then, is the glory of man. God has done an extraordinary thing with his human tool. And he can do something along these lines with Christians if they yield to the word, not to the sinless extent that Jesus did, of course. But we should be expressive vehicles of the truth of God if the spirit and the word of God is dwelling in us. Yet another popular proof text from John reads, Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. John 20, 27. Thomas's statement in John 20, 28, after the resurrection, he sees Jesus and he says, my Lord and my God. But again, this doesn't mean that he is calling Jesus Almighty God. He uh, very well and equally could be saying that he recognizes Jesus as being a mighty, uh, a mighty individual in the same sense that the leaders of Israel, well, it may be higher than that, but if the leaders of Israel could be called gods, Elohim, in Psalm 82 and verse 6, then the, the functional equivalent, language-wise, that appears in John 20, 28, um, where the Greek word theos is used, um, can he as well be uh, applied to a man and not mean uh, that God's singularity is being um, uh, infringed upon. Hmm. The, and as far as that's concerned, um, the judges of Israel, Elohim, are called God with the, with the Greek word theos in the Septuagint translation of Psalm 86 that I'm referring to. So... Uh, Thomas isn't saying something that hadn't already been said of other men on another occasion using the word God. So it, it's going to take a pre 
preconceived notion or predisposition to to impose upon John twenty twenty eight that that Thomas was calling Jesus Almighty God. As far as Jesus being called God, um, we have to recognize that judges were called gods, and he uses that in an argument. The kings of Israel were called gods. Psalm forty five verse six. Um, furthermore. Um, John uh, records Thomas saying, my Lord and my God. Domitian um, was called God. And I think that's something we need to, that the emperors of that time period were called God. So there's a, there's, Satan is called God in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. So I think we need to recognize that God is used, um, applied to different individuals, but only a handful of times. And I think if we recognize that Jesus' father, Yahweh, is actually called God some 1,200 plus times. So I think there's a contextual difference between between God the Father and then these other individuals that are also called God. And I think that these other individuals, the kings, the the, the judges, are God's representatives, God's vice regents, God's um, uh, anointed um, uh, uh, anointed ones who represent Him. So I think that's a, that can help us understand why that these other individuals are called, or you that word is applied to them. Another popular proof text for the doctrine of the Trinity reads, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9.6 Well, certainly in, in context there, uh, what you're dealing with is, this is, the seven, this is in the 8th century, before Christ, and, and it's the time of Hezekiah, or just before the time of Hezekiah, Hezekiah's father Ahaz is on the throne, and you've got the 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 Aramean Israel, Israelites, that's the ten northern tribes, alliance facing hostily and attacking against Judah, and so forth, and basically God says there's going to be a sign that a child will be born. And even though you haven't asked it in heaven or above, and Ahaz says, no, I won't ask a sign. I'm not going to tempt the Lord. He says, well, even if you don't ask it, there is going to be a sign. And before this child will know the difference between good and evil, the, the Israelite king and the Aramean king will be, di will be no more. So basically, in the 8th century, before the common era, before Christ, there in the in the this Israel Israelite Aramean alliance that will come to an end at, at about the time that this child is born. Well in the context it seems obvious to to a number of scholars that this is a reference to Hezekiah. And uh, and later on of course this was taken and adopted in a very homiletical sort of way by by Matthew and applied to mm -hmm. Jesus. Now, as far as he will, he will, he will be called uh, the mighty God, you know. Well, it uses a special technical term there, there, which in in fact does not mean God Almighty. It it really means like a like a mighty warrior, a divinely inspired warrior. If Jesus was not God, what makes his sacrifice, dying, important enough to, to cover the sins of all mankind? There is nothing in the scripture that says God has to die for men to be saved. That is something that human beings have brought to the discussion through human reason. It is not a scriptural requirement of Messiah, not a scriptural requirement of, of the sacrifice. It's simply something that we reason that seems right. In fact, it's interesting. I'm reading through uh, the uh, the book when Jesus became God, and that was Athanasius's main point. His main point was not really ontological; it was soteriological. How are men to be saved? Well, if Jesus went to God, how could he possibly save everybody? That's not what Paul said. There's a mediator between the one God and men. That's the man, Christ Jesus, the man. And this is well after the resurrection of Christ that Paul is still referring to him as a man. And as he said in Romans 5, that that justification, that obedience of going to the cross for our sakes was accomplished by a man. So I'm, I have to think that sure you want to say with this 
grandiose argument, if he wasn't God, it's no good. Well, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible said. It came by that man, Jesus Christ. Animal sacrifice, or however they handled it, would be sufficient for all the sins of the Israelites at that period, for that amount of time, because it was the acceptable sacrifice. And so I just wanted to uh, uh, reiterate, I suppose, that God's acceptance of the sacrifice is the primary point. It's not the point of the kind of sacrifice, whether it was Christ or whether it was a lamb or whatever it was, but it was the acceptance of God that makes the sacrifice acceptable. In the Old Testament, if you sin, you were worthy of death. But if a bull or a calf or whatever was sacrificed, they was allowed to die and shed their blood in your stead. Now, how much more value is a bull than you to uh, make it worthwhile taking away your sin with its life? So, God does not place His forgiveness on the value of the sacrifice. It's up to Him to determine. Right. It was. It was. The point was that a sacrifice was made. Yeah, like a dove, even. There is also another kind of logic that Trinitarians use to substantiate the validity of the Trinity. Trinitarian apologists often do this by taking examples from nature and correlating them with their doctrine. They are actually wanting to hold to monotheism, they want to identify themselves as monotheists, they believe in only one God, but I really think that they are not being honest, in other words, I think they are holding three kings, you know, behind the, and they are just saying, no, I only have one king, I only have one king. You know, so I, I don't think that that answers the question. I think they need to be honest and say, you know, I do have three gods, and I want to be a monotheist. So you can say you're a monotheist all day long, but I think it's not being true to reality. It's, you, can call, you know, I can say I'm a woman, but it doesn't change the fact. You know, so I don't think that... Uh, that, that and as far as... Um, what was it, the second... Oh, as far as Jesus or the Holy Spirit being called God, yes, I think so, because I think that... I, first of all, with the word Holy Spirit, I think we need to recognize that that word is used in many different ways in, in Scripture. So I think it would be wrong to say that we need to come up with one definition of Holy Spirit and apply it to every time it's used. And so I think we can realize and recognize that sometimes Holy Spirit is a second temple period uh, synonym for God. And so God is the Holy Spirit, but I don't think it's a separate person than the one God of Israel. I don't think that there are you know, here's the Holy Spirit and here's God the Father. I think that God the Father is the Holy Spirit and I think it's used that way sometimes. We had constantly, there's a mystery of the Trinity that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are really one essence. I would accept that, of course. I don't see that mystery anywhere. On the contrary, I see multiple statements of the unitary monotheistic position of Jesus and of Paul. So I don't think there's any mystery there. And secondly, then, I think the facts of the Bible can be explained without that mystery. I certainly agree that if you put Father and Son and Holy Spirit together, you can create that mystery, but you don't need to. You don't need to at all. The facts are explicable on a much more reasonable and easy basis. I don't think God wanted to mystify us in terms of his definition. Now, having said that, I want to add this, that there are, of course, lots of things about God we don't know. Vast ranges of things. But what he's revealed to us in plain language is not a mystification. Otherwise it wouldn't be a revelation. And I think scripture is very plain here. After all, 20,000 singular 
personal pronouns for God. The absence of any single account of the word God to mean the triune God is shocking evidence to me. Very powerful. And I wasn't born into this, but many of us who are somehow challenged to study this find this very compelling evidence. So we've heard the Trinitarian defense for the divinity of Jesus, but how do Unitarians defend their position? It sounds great, it sounds great to say Jesus is God. The problem with that is, of course, it interferes with the first commandment, that God is only one. So in promoting Jesus beyond what the Bible allows, we are interfering with the supremacy of the one God. The second point would be this, that it turns Jesus into the creator of heaven and earth. And that's a serious issue. The Bible is quite clear 50 times. It says there's only one sole creator. Isaiah 44, 24 is the key text. The father there, Yahweh, the God of Israel, who is one single person 7,000 times, Yahweh, uh, roughly 7,000 times, he says, I alone created the heavens and the earth. Nobody was with me. I was solo, unaccompanied, unattended at the creation. Now to say then that the Son of God was really there doing the creating is to interfere with that supremacy of the one God. And this we cannot do. What we can say, however, is Jesus is not in any way just a man an average man. First of all, he's virginally begotten. He's the reason for the whole creation. From the very beginning, God had his son in mind because his son is to be the model of man in relation to God. This is how you do human life in relation to God. You follow the model of Jesus. Once we say that Jesus is or was God, we've destroyed that model. Now you're presenting a model of God in relation to God. That's fine, but doesn't not much relevance to me. I'm a human being. I'm supposed to see how we do the relationship of man to God. Jesus does it. Therefore, he has to be a man. The whole point of the Messiah in Jewish theology, in biblical theology, is that he's a man. The whole point, that he's the second Adam. God has a creation. Adam makes him the image of God. He's designed to reflect God, represent God as king in the garden, and he fails under the influence of Satan. So now comes the second man. Let's try again. Let's do man mark two. If Jesus is not man, he, he isn't the Messiah. The Messiah, the model of man in relation to God, has to be man. Otherwise, the whole story is ruined, in fact. His whole life is a charade, then. If he's God, he can't be tempted. So the temptation in the wilderness is mockery. There's nothing to be tempted there. If God, God cannot be tempted, James says. Therefore, Jesus couldn't have been tempted. And if he's God, he can't die. 1 Timothy 6.16 says that God, talking of the Father, the one who is invisible, nobody's seen him, cannot die. Well, God also cannot lie. And so it's impossible for God to die. The Bible plainly says that the Son of God died. So then we get into the most extraordinary twistings and turnings of arguments. Well, we say his body died, but his person didn't. And we're trying to split him up now to allow a sort of a bit that did die, a bit that was tempted, but it winds up in the most terribly convoluted arguments. T fearfully complex. Again, the clergy then put the laity under guardians. We clergy will explain this to you, but you're not supposed to understand this. That's totally unsatisfactory. The essence of the Bible is simplicity. Here. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man, the Messiah, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 6. Paul says uh, to the pagan world, there are many gods, lots of gods, lots of lords. But to us Christians now, there's one God, the Father. That's clear. Not one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is no text in the Bible where the word God, which occurs about four and a half thousand times, no text in which you can show that that word God means God existing in three persons. Triune God. None. Which is to say that no Bible writer ever, when he said God, meant the triune God. you think that would discourage people. But it seems not to because tradition is extraordinarily powerful. So it's simply then a fact that what God has done with Jesus is a marvelous thing with human beings. The other view turns him into God. The argument goes like this. Well, look at all the miracles Jesus did. We know man can't do that. So this fellow has to be God. He's forgiving sins. Well, we know only God can forgive sins. So he must be God. That's not quite right. God has authorized this human being, which is really the glory of man, if you like. He's taken this sinless human being and he said, let me show you what I can do with my marvelous created son whom I love. I'll authorize him to forgive sins, but I'll authorize it. He's not forgiving sins. I'm doing it through him. I'll do miracles through him. He's not doing the miraculous stuff. 
I'm doing it through him. But look then at the power of Jesus as man. God has invested everything in him. But it doesn't mean that Jesus ever claimed to be God. On the simple principle, for instance, John's Gospel says nobody's ever seen God at any time. Nobody has ever seen God at any time. Did they see Jesus? Yes. Nobody thought he was God. Although his claims are enormous, he says, you've seen the character of God in me. I'm God's representative. I'm the chip off the old block. I reflect the character of God. But the moment they suggested he was blaspheming by saying he was God, he denied it immediately and kept saying the Father was God. I don't think that Jesus thought he was God. Uh, just the opposite. I thought that he worshipped and prayed and followed a God. I don't think that he had the conception. I, and actually, I don't think there's any indication that would even lead us to think that he thought himself as God. When anyone got the inkling that he was taking prerogatives of God, he quickly um, refuted that and said, no, I'm not... I'm not equal to God. God has actually given me this authority, given me this power, given me the ability to do the things that I'm doing. Um, so I think he, and he put himself in the class of, you know, he basically said, if the wicked judges of Israel could be called gods, how much more could uh, the Son of God or God's Son? So I think that there's a, there's a sense in which Jesus removes the idea from anyone's mind that he might be the one God of Israel. So I don't think that was a, a conception that he, that he had. First of all, I might start with a passage like Luke one thirty-five, where the angel Gabriel says to Mary um, that she's going to have a son, and he's going to be called the Son of God, or the Son of the Most High, um, sit on the throne of David and all of this type of stuff. And Mary says, well, how can this be since I do not know a man, which is a, a idiom for I... I I'm not married, I've not had sexual relations, however you want to look at it. And um, Gabriel explains to her how the Holy Spirit would come upon her and she would conceive and bear a son. And then he uses a very special word. He says dia, D-I-O in English letters, which in Greek translates for this very precise reason, namely that the Holy Spirit would be the cause of you being pregnant and having a child. For this precise reason, the holy thing that is born will be called the Son of God. God essentially fathers um, the Son by means of the Holy Spirit. So I would say that early on, I mean before Jesus is actually even conceived, we are told that he will be God's son, not because he had forever been God's son, but because his birth would make him God's son. I would connect that perhaps with Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7. Um, you are my son, God says actually to the king of Israel. You are my son, this day have I become your father, or this day have I begotten you. The word to beget means to become the father of. Well, that verse is applied to Jesus in various New Testament texts. And I would say, um, how can someone become the father of a son if the person had eternally been a begotten son? You can't eternally beget something. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Well, if uh, God has exalted Jesus and given him the name above all names, if Jesus was the eternal God from eternity past, there would be no reason to give him that name which is above every name. He would have already had it. Um, and so clearly it says that God gave it to him. It says because he humbled himself and was obedient to death, it shows a causality there. Jesus obeyed God and humbled himself even to the point of death. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That's something that he didn't have before. 
and that's something that God gave him because of his humility and his obedience. The text is very clear. It says that Jesus was exalted to sit at the right hand of God. I mean, that is very exalted to have a human being sitting at the right hand of God. So the language definitely communicates that this is an extremely exalted position. Everything as high as a, as a human being can possibly be exalted, it seems. You know, God gives all authority in heaven and earth. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You know, so I think that, 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 that that's a pretty exalted state. And uh, I don't think we should denigrate Jesus in any way. And, and, and for those who would say this is a low Christology, I think they're mistaken. You know, I, I ask the term, is how high is too high? And I think what they want to say is, well, if Jesus isn't the one God of Israel, then he's nothing at all. And it's far, far from it. I mean, if, if, he, if, if Jesus has been given a name that is above every name... He's inherited, even if it is the name of Yahweh, because God did give his name to various individuals. We can read Exodus 21, where God gives his name to an angel, to a messenger. And when people speak, when the messenger speaks, he speaks for Yahweh. And when, the, when people respond, they're responding to the angel as if the angel is Yahweh. So, I mean, that's pretty, pretty important and I think pretty significant. And if that's the name that's given to Jesus, it's not that he possessed that by nature. Somehow he was always around, but that God gave him uh, and distributed his name, so to speak, and exalted him. But it's never usurping. You know, I think 1 Corinthians 15, 28 is a beautiful picture because it says that in the end, uh, Jesus hands back the kingdom to God the Father so that God might be all in all. In other words, if Jesus continued to rule, then he, God wouldn't be all in all because it would be a human ruling and maybe God de delegating that, that rulership. But ultimately, Jesus, uh, or, or the text, 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty eight, everything's handed back to the Father so that, in order that God would be all in all. I think that's pretty significant. In John chapter 10, verses 23 and following, he was, a, a group of people attempted to stone him. And he said, why are you stoning me? And they said, because... You, a man, being a man, claimed to be God. At which point, he corrected their misunderstanding by saying, "Well, look, let's talk terminology here. Um, have I not said that ye are gods?" He quotes Psalm chapter eighty-two, where God speaks of the judges of Israel and calls them gods. And he says, "If the Scriptures can say something like that." and the scriptures can't be broken, why are you guys getting upset if I claim not to be God, but if I claim to be the Son of God? So he, he didn't even, he, he tried to let them understand that he wasn't even going so far as to say that he was God, as they were accusing him of. He was only willing to say that he was God's Son, and that even if he were saying that he were a God, it wouldn't necessarily be bad since they themselves accepted such terminology when applied to rulers and leaders in, in Israel. Psalm 82, verse 6. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 5, for instance, says, Let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone. God cannot be tempted. And then I might turn over to a passage like Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, which says that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we were, but he was without sin. God cannot be tempted, but Jesus was tempted. I know that the Trinitarian response to that is that, well, Jesus has a dual nature. Well, show me that in my scriptures. It's assumed, but it certainly isn't proven on the basis of any written scripture. And even if it were the truth, one would have to immediately admit that it is just as logical or sensible, I should say, to accept the concept that Jesus isn't God since God can't be tempted as it is to create a concept of a dual nature in Jesus and, and make him a God-man, which has problems of its own because Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 16 basically says that Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every way. If that is the truth, how in the world can Jesus be like me or like you, who are his brothers, because none of us are God-men?
or men with dual natures? I think the position is this, that the, within the pages of scripture you have this constant backbone of unitary monotheism. It's a Jewish book, all the writers with the possible exception of Luke, but with that exception they're all Jews. And for Jews this is not something you argue about, it's just part of the established religious position. And there is no discussion of this in the New Testament. Nobody ever says to Paul, you're introducing three gods or some such language. When Jesus is challenged in the Gospel of John and, said, and they say to him, you're, son as though you're usurping the position of God, he very quickly puts the record straight. And he says, I can do nothing by myself. Now if he's God, that's a very deep potentiated God, isn't it? I'm only doing what the Father's telling me not to do, to tell me to do. He's the perfect model son, but he never ever says, I'm as good as my dad, you know, co-equal in that sense. He does make though, and I, I want to make this very clear, we're not just saying that Jesus is an ordinary man, what some people call a mere man, whatever that means. He's a uniquely begotten son. He's the head of the new human race, the first Adam fails. Adam is called the Son of God in, in Gospel of Luke. Jesus is the new head of the new creation. There really isn't, and that's, I think, a major problem for the post, what I would call a post-biblical creed of the Trinitarian style. If you take the, let's say, 12,000 occurrences of the word for God in the Bible, that would be Hebrew words like Yahweh, the God of Israel, uh, Adonai, the Lord God, and words like Elohim, which occur thousands of times too, and then you add to that the Greek word theos, or theos, meaning God, which occurs about 1,320 times. If you add all that together, you've got about 12,000 opportunities of saying God in the Bible. I would challenge anyone to find a single one of those 12,000 occurrences which could reasonably be said to mean the triune God. Now that's astonishing to me. In the vast majority of cases, the word God means the Father of Jesus, that's clear. On a couple of occasions, for sure, Jesus is called God in some sense. That's 1,300 times for the Father versus two for Jesus. But what doesn't happen is that nowhere does that word God amount to a triune Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's an extraordinary thing. Are we saying then that the triune God doesn't get a mention as such in the pages of the Bible? I think that's what we need to face. If Jesus is God, first of all, he cannot die. That's problematic. If he can't die, then who died for our sins? It says the Son of God died. And in Trinitarian theology, the Son is the God part. It's the divine, the deity part. Well, how did the deity die? The Son died. The New Testament says that. So we're left then without a Savior. But if he's mortal, he can die. The Son of God, the human being, Jesus, died. He's mortal. That's refreshing. Now we know we've got a Savior for our sins, one who died for us. If he's God, he cannot be tempted, that's clear. So the temptation story would be a, a kind of charade, it would be a game. And yet he was tempted in all points. So then Trinitarian theory has to say, well, part of him died, part didn't. He functions as God in some respects, and at other times he switches off the deity part and functions as man. For the classic case is, I don't know the time of the second coming, Jesus is reported as saying. Well, if he's God, he does. It's like saying, to you, you ask me, well, have you got any money? And I say, well, I haven't. Well, actually, I have in one pocket, but not in the other. Or, are you blind? Uh, well, yes, but I can see out of one eye. You see, we're playing language games here. And I want to suggest that the devil is heavily involved in language tricks of all sorts. And then when we furthermore read some of the leading Trinitarian scholars today, like uh, Millard Erickson and um, Murray Harris and so on, we're amazed to find them conceding, conceding a great deal of this sort of argument. I'm thinking of Millard Erickson who says that his favorite logician, I've forgotten the guy, but the guy who's tangles with the logic of theological propositions, is unable to explain how you can be one in one sense and three in another. Nobody has really achieved that. At which point, as you said, it disappears into mystery. I just don't think we need that. It need not be that mystery if we assemble the facts in the much more obvious way, namely that this word God occurs for the Father all over the place. But Jesus' own creed fixes it for me. If I believe in Jesus, I don't think I can turn my back on his teachings. It seems to me the book of John and the rest of the New Testament say, 
don't ever fail to listen to your Messiah because you're going to be judged by his word, words, is that right? So I want to start where Jesus starts. The most important thing is to get God understood correctly. Mm. Well, I think that's called the, the era of false dilemma in logic, isn't it? Where you put choices before someone and say, now choose, which is it? But you very cleverly don't tell them the right, the choice that's the true one. So this is a C.S. Lewis statement. Mad, bad, or God. Make your choice. Clearly Jesus isn't mad, clearly he's not evil, you're left with one choice, he's God. No, that's wrong. He didn't offer you the choice that Jesus approved, that he's the Son of God, the Messiah. So the classic statement, of course, is where Peter is asked this very interesting question, who do you say that I am, Jesus says. I want you to note that Jesus is deeply interested in, in Christology. I want to know who you think I am, let's get this one clear before we do any Christian living, let's decide who I am. And the response to that question is, you are the Messiah, the Christ, that is, the Son of the living God. That's the rock foundation on which all theology of Jesus should be built. To move beyond that and say, no, he's God the Son, creates an inscrutable problem that nobody's ever solved, and they admit that. They really have not solved it, so it's a mystery. So I'm simply forgetting back to the simplicity of Jesus' creed. It's very straightforward. The Father is God. Let's just give you the classic statement in John 17, 3. The Son, as one translation now puts it nicely, the Son of of Christianity is this, John 17, 3. This is eternal life, we read in our text. The sum of gaining immortality, you might say, is as follows, colon, that you believe that God is the Father, Jesus said, that they should believe in you, Father, as omonos alitinos theos, that's the Greek for the only one who is truly God. And also you believe in Jesus as the Messiah whom he sent as his ambassador, and this is eternal life, that they know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, 3. This verse presents a clear distinction between the one true God as being the one who sent Jesus and Jesus himself. In contrast to what has become traditional Christian orthodoxy, Biblical Unitarians recognize this distinction between Jesus and the one true God, whereas Trinitarians insist that Jesus is or is a part of the one true God. They are closely coordinated, but they're not both God. When Augustine came to that text, he was stuck. Because in his theology, it really ought to say that they believe in you, Father, and Jesus Christ, comma, the one true God. And that's what he actually does in his homilies on John. He simply rearranges the words, in my opinion, uh, very violently, in the opinion of most commonly, very violently, to accommodate this to his, by then, strong Trinitarian views. I think it's very unfair on the documents. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus affirmed the Jewish creed, clearly. Why do we need to go beyond that? I don't think we do. There's a sense in which Jesus removes the idea from anyone's mind that he might be the one God of Israel. When anyone got the inkling that he was taking prerogatives of God, he quickly um, refuted that and said, no, I'm not, I'm not equal to God. God has actually given me this authority, given me this power, given me the ability to do the things that I'm doing. He basically said, if the wicked judges of Israel could be called gods, how much more could uh, the Son of God or God's Son? So, to put it simply, God is not a man. Jesus is a man. God cannot die. And Jesus died. God cannot be tempted. Yet Jesus was tempted. So, is it unreasonable to conclude that God does not equal Jesus? And if the concept of Jesus being Almighty God is so confusing and unbiblical, how is it that defenders of the faith are able to hold on to the idea that Jesus is God? And I can tell you in one word, tradition! You're not a tempter. We have traditions for everything. How to sleep, how to eat, how to work, how to wear clothes. For instance, we always keep our heads covered and always wear a little prayer shawl. 
This shows our constant devotion to God. You may ask, how did this tradition get started? I'll tell you. I don't know. But it's a tradition. Let the chips fall where they may. Let God be true and every man a liar. And that's my approach to it. I'm, I'm not, never been interested in, in defending anyone's legacy. But what I found is that a lot of people are. That you think that they're standing side by side with you on doctrinal issues uh, because they're about, about the truth when you find out they're really about defending a legacy, protecting a church. Uh, preserving a movement. Well, the, 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 the danger is, is precisely committing idolatry. You know, we don't, I, I mentioned this in my lecture yesterday, we don't have the right to believe whatever we want to believe. That's a distinctly American notion, and it's a beautiful thing because it preserves our freedoms of conscience and religion. But before God, we don't have that right. Before man, we do. Before the Constitution of the United States, we have that right to believe what we want to believe, but before God, we don't. And I think a lot of people are fuzzy on that issue. They think that they have, Christians, there are Christians who believe they have the right to believe what they want to believe. They're wrong. They don't. We don't own our minds. If you're a Christian, you've been bought with a price. That includes all of you, your body and your mind, your spirit, everything. God owns you. You're, pro you're his property. And you don't have the right to believe what you want to believe. You only have the right to believe what he wants you to believe. I don't have much sympathy for willful ignorance. I mean, I, I don't have much sympathy for someone today who is literate, not being able to go out and inform themselves on these things. There are historical documents available. There are theological dictionaries. There are scholars that are working in these areas. Um, obviously, a person wants a simple faith. Um, a simple faith is one thing, but to be simplistic and just assume that what I've been taught is what the text is saying actually requires many more assumptions in many cases. You know, in the case of this, one just has to look at how was John 1, 1 interpreted. Well, it was interpreted a certain way after Constantine and after certain church fathers said certain things, and, and at one time the Trinitarian position was a minority position. Bef before that, the simple Christians said, well, why would we follow along with this complicated three-in-one and all of that sort of thing. So I think it's pretty much what where one wants to put their faith in that sense. But at a historical, exegetical sense, meaning what the text says in its own terms on, in it, from its own time, it takes a little bit of work to get that out. That may sound elitist um, or uh, just saying, well, you've got to consult scholars or whatever, but the fact of the matter is, if you want to get to the, to the bottom of some historical idea, you do have to do some, some digging and then decide whether, ultimately it's a personal decision, whether one is going to accept whatever fruits of the investigation one finds. And people do come up with different answers on this. One, one can ask whether they come up for, with different answers because they already have commitments from their gen denominations. And I think often that is the case. If you want to dig for the truth of a thing and uh, risk being at odds, people risk being a free thinker. You know that has its advantages. It also has its social burdens at times. You know people don't don't like being dissented from, particularly in matters where they should be the most tentative because we can't see these things. They're often the most dogmatic. <laughs> you know? Well, orthodox is simply just a convenient label to, to designate those who go by the creeds. Orthodox means right opinion. So right opinion is what was inscribed in those creeds in 325 and 451. So that's all that is. And if you're, if you're not believing in the Trinity, you're, you're supposed to be, you're judged to be beyond the limits of the Christian faith. You're not saved. Because from the point of view of that orthodoxy, you're in fact believing something that isn't true. You're believing a lie. The truth is there in, under that system perceived to be that God is three, however mysterious that might be. And so the danger is um, actually sort of worshipping God in the image created by a man, which is, I mean, is that not the, the definition of idolatry? Right. It is what idolatry is. Right. We're told in John 4 that God is looking for people to worship him in the spirit of truth, right? That's John's expression for the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the truth. 
We need to be careful then to get our definitions of God and Jesus correct in order to worship God in spirit and in truth. Christians are being murdered every day even for their beliefs here. Personally, I have been, I have been maligned. I have been called names. I have uh, been lied about, been stabbed in the back a few times with respect to, to people going to someone else and attempting to, to cause me trouble. But that is kind of the extent of it. You know, you get, you get uh, thrown out of churches. You get thrown off of uh, forums, off of the Internet. And if you, if you espouse a particular view, they don't want to hear that. And that's, that's awfully strange, I think. Young Spanish physician Michael Cervetes is today widely considered to be the discoverer and the first person to record a modern understanding of pulmonary respiration. As renowned as he was in the medical field, he was equally active in the area of theology and began attracting a reputation with his writings, such as this one, entitled The Erroneous Trinity which promoted that the traditional understanding of Jesus and God reflected in the doctrine of the Trinity was not biblically sound. Then a rising star in Geneva, John Calvin, who was already familiar with the works of Servetus, made it known among colleagues that Servetus was to be put to death immediately should he be found within Geneva because of his heretical beliefs. And so it was that upon arrival in Geneva, Servetus was arrested and taken into captivity to keep him from promoting his Unitarian belief. John Calvin extracted 38 statements from the writings of Servetus, pointing to them as heretical and against the Orthodox faith, and presented them to the court to have Michael Servetus killed. And so it was that on October 27, 1553, Michael Servetus became a martyr for proclaiming that Jesus was the Son of God, as opposed to God the Son. Uh, yes, there, there are a number, and they're listed in, in the classic on the Radical Reformation, that's that third wing, Anabaptist wing, by G. H. Williams, Dr. G. H. Williams, his, the, really the Bible of the Ra Radical Reformation, called the Radical Reformation. He lists a number of noble souls in England, and, and I can't name the minor ones, the less known ones, but they died for saying that Jesus isn't God, he's the Son of God. But the classic cases were the Spanish theologian, young Spanish theologian Michael Servetus, uh, got in a tangle with John Calvin, the reformer. And admittedly, Servetus was very outspoken. He may not have always been as diplomatic as he might be. But Calvin decided to do him in. And he actually used, Calvin used the strong arm of the Roman Catholic Church to have this man burned at the stake. Now that, I think, was a terrible blot on the whole Protestant Reformation. Calvin never apparently repented of that, was not sorry, although a number of his colleagues and friends said, you should not do this. And a number were very upset that uh, he had done it. But to me, this is absolutely impossible. Judicial murder is out of the question. Much less can you use the strong arm of the state and the Catholic Church to kill your theological opponent. It simply showed that Calvin didn't understand, I think, the spirit of God at that point at all. What came out of that, though, was a good thing. The blood of the martyrs, you know, has the seed of many good things. People don't die in vain. People were so shocked by that. They said, never again. Whatever we do, they said, let's have a spirit of freedom to speak. And, and the free speech that you and I are enjoying right now, and in other parts of the world, not everywhere, is probably due, to some extent, to that heroic death of Servetus, where people said enough is enough. A number of American presidents expressed their interest in the Unitarian Socinian group that grew out of the Servetus theology. The Socinians were the, the uncle and nephew Socini at the time of the Reformation, 1517 or, or so, who really developed this whole idea of the unity of God, Jesus being the Son of God but not God, and Jesus not pre-existing as the Son of God. So they just held that view as far as we can make out. But all of that together then did shake the world into the realization that killing people in the name of Jesus is absolutely out of the question, totally unbiblical, as it always will be. I think it should warn them that any form of persecution is in itself a denial of the spirit of Jesus. If you're going to persecute someone else to the point of death, martyrdom, you have obviously have missed the entire point of Christianity. Jesus is the model of self-giving love. He goes on the cross not opposing his enemies. Stephen was stoned 
there's no evidence at all that his friends ra rallied around and tried to stone the enemy's back. So if it's not an expression of love, and if it turns into an expression of hatred and killing, the person on that side of the argument should, should examine himself. There's no authority in the New Testament at all for persecuting or killing, much less killing, somebody who takes a different doctrinal point of view than you do. So any martyrdom for the Unitarian faith by so-called Trinitarians would point immediately to the fact that those Trinitarians were not operating under the Spirit of Christ by definition. By this you know Christians, Christians by love. That cannot be love when you are actually murdering your opponent. And so, out of fear, I believe, of, of being associated with a cultic group, with a cultic group, um, the Trinity has to be affirmed. And one of the techniques or tactics of keeping people from holding to a non-Trinitarian perspective is to say, well, you don't want to be like a Mormon, or you don't want to be like a Jehovah's Witness, or whatever they would want to say, that they know that people in general hold a pejorative perspective of those groups, and so uh, they throw out an ad hominem argument against the doctrine of a Unitarian doctrine simply because they know that people already don't accept those groups. I don't think that's right thinking. Uh, it does relate back to a correct understanding of God because if you miss that then you know your, your whole basis might be wrong you get off you, right. you see what I'm saying that's where you come into play that's where you come into play too you see that gentleman right there he's got a shirt on right well I'll give you an example uh, yeah. what was your name sir Rufus Rufus if he start buzzing that if he get this bottom button wrong the rest of them going to be wrong right and this is our relationship with God we got to get okay. the foundation right in order to because from that point on, it, everything is wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, I may get on an airplane tomorrow going to California, but if I was going to Chicago, that may be a good ride, but everything is wrong. <laughs> My food is wrong. My food is going to Chicago. I'm going to Los Angeles. So yeah, from that point on, that's what I'm talking about, about the Trinity and God. If we get that wrong, we're going to get everything else wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And the anti-Trinitarian point of view is simply, no, this wasn't a fair development from the New Testament. It in fact was a deviation, even a corruption, a perversion, one church historian says, a perversion of the original Unitarian faith and created enormous complexities of language, created this mystery, and worst of all, it led to conflict, excommunication, banishment, and even killing and roasting at the stake in later history. That's a great tragedy. And of course it also set up our current division between Muslims, Jews, and Christians those three great sectors of world religion who are now at loggerheads on who God is and who the Son is in relation to the Father. Now, I, I, I'm told that this kind of approach at least makes Christian thinking more accessible to Muslims than uh, a, a, a social trinitarianism which says that each of the three beings are three separate beings each with a mind each with a will each with a life three divine beings acting in concert <laughs> The deity of Jesus Christ is be upon him. It puts Christianity apart from everybody else, from every other religion. It's not just a, a conflict between Christianity and, and Islam. Uh, and it's a major element. We do accept Judaism. We do accept the Torah. We do accept uh, Moses as the liberator of the oppressed people uh, from the tyranny in Egypt. We do accept that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of Mary and the Messiah. But we add to it clarity, but he is no, he's not God. But this, this is not demeaning to Jesus himself. It, it, it's, it's an honor to Jesus that he is he's described in the Quran. How uh, mo, The most honored person in the Quran, 
that he says he is the word of God and a spirit from him to Mary no other uh, born human being was over, ever described as he is the word of God and a spirit from him so the over simplistic way that some Muslim might tell you oh Jesus is just another prophet no he's not just another prophet there are hundreds of other prophets but Jesus is not just another prophet he is the Messiah he is when you believe as a Muslim when I believe in Jesus for what he is it is strengthening my faith in God uh, the Quran itself says that we should follow the people of the book so there's an interest in scripture from the Islamic point of view too the Jews of course do believe in the scripture of the Hebrew Bible so ecumenism for me is fine if we all agree not to kill each other first of all let's however admit the difficulties the differences why not start by trying to get us all together around the table to decide what Jesus said about who God is and the Jews will like that it might induce them to look further at the life of Jesus Islamic people would also favor that it might uh, encourage them to look at the resurrection of Jesus and the death of Jesus which they don't believe in the resurrection uh, the death rather they don't believe in but that kind of getting us all together is fine the point is we must not build the barriers so sharply that we condemn each other while we're going through the process of reconstruction and restoration. Biblical Unitarians today are largely outnumbered by Orthodox Christians. However, they are not inactive. A kind of theological underground, they network at what they call One God Conferences and other semi-annual gatherings such as this one in Tyler, Texas. Openly discussing issues of theological importance without fear of judgment or dismissal is a huge part of the culture. Whereas Christ being killed on the 14th, that satisfies this condition. And to eat it the same night, well, yeah, that satisfies the condition too, I suppose. When you mention these persons who are feeling freed from the necessity to believe the dogmas, that's a healthy thing. Protestants, by definition, are those who take the Bible, sola scriptura, and they, are, they express the idea that they're not bound by creeds. Even in the Church of England 39 articles, it says creeds do not speak with the authority of the Bible. That's the ideal. In practice, that doesn't normally happen. But if there are people today, and you're right, there are many, who really do question this very complex doctrine. So they are the real Protestants, and they align themselves with the anti- or the the, explorer, the explorers of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the Anabaptist group, right, who also felt that these dogmas should not be binding upon them. So yes, that's a healthy development. I think we're living in days of extraordinary uh, information. We're in the information age, and people are beginning to see there are problems here, uh, and that's a healthy development for us. I think people would benefit greatly by understanding that Jesus is a human, that God has exalted because it would help clarify to them the actual gospel. Well, I think that we always need to put any of our beliefs, especially cherished religious beliefs, on the chopping block in as much as we need to be willing to re-examine whatever we think or believe in the light of scripture. Uh, and if we see something in scripture that indicates other than what we believe we've got to have the humility to be willing to change i believe that jesus was a man who was born raised and killed died for me god honored him in his obedience by raising him from the dead and jesus said come along I did it, you can do it. I couldn't do it before him. It would be impossible. But because he did that, he said, if you overcome, I'll let you sit down in my throne, just like I overcame and then sat down in my father's throne. He, as a man of his own choice, decided to obey the Father. And so it's possible then for us to have that as a true example. If he was God, then it, it wouldn't be that hard. And it would be impossible for us to emulate him or try to imitate him in any way. 
this way he's a living savior he's a real person who made choices to love who made choices to to not be angry in sin if one wants to to think of jesus as as a divinely empowered hero a divinely empowered messiah an anointed son etc et all these things that are that have deep roots within the christian tradition then one then one is on, standing on very solid ground there. If one wants to see Jesus as claiming that that he's God and uh, and so forth, well, one is on the short end of the stick, evidence-wise. The fact is that people need plenty of time to think this through. Nobody should be coerced. The Bible doesn't coerce us. It doesn't possess us. It persuades us. So people need a lot of time to reflect on these issues, but having decided that Jesus wasn't a Trinitarian and wishing to follow Jesus, you'd think it would be reasonable that they would quote his Unitarian creed. I think that the humble side needs to be, needs to prevail. We need to take humility. I was wrong. Is it difficult to say? If, if, it, if he does anything at all, he demonstrates that if a person fully relies and trusts in God, he can be what God wants him to be. I am not a sinless person, but if I believe that Jesus is a man like me and that he wants me to be like him, then I also am not a victim which other perspectives tend to promote. I don't have to walk around feeling that I can't do anything. If Jesus, my Lord, did as a human what he wants me to do by taking the lead, then I need to step up and take responsibility for more than what I may have presumed based on a different understanding of God. But if Jesus did it as a God, then how does that make you feel? Well, if Jesus did it as a God, there's a lot of, about the scripture that, that would not be inspiring to me anymore. Because I can't do what a God can do. I can do what a man can do. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It makes no sense if a person um, is unable to say avoid sin because we can, based on that verse. God will provide a way out. Do we take it all the time? No. Why not? Because we don't step up to our responsibility. We don't accept what Jesus said we, we can do. I think that, that that actually does influence the way believers act in the world when I remember thinking that, well, Jesus, if, you know, well, Jesus can do all kinds of things. Well, of course he can because he's God. And I think, you know, I, and I think, I can't do that. I'm not God. And so I think, at least for me, when I came to the understanding that Jesus was a human being, a man, that I said, wow, look at what God can do through a human being. And it gives, I think, us hope that this isn't just a, that Jesus acted and lived and had faith and trust in God the way that he did, that it's actually possible. And I think that is one element that... that uh, that understanding Jesus as a human being can encourage us to act more. Furthermore, I think uh, a Christian self-perception, if they think they're nothing, they're worthless, they're hopeless, they're, uh, you know, they're depraved in every way, I think that can hinder them from, from going out and being productive and useful and helpful in the world because they have such a negative view of their self. So I think that they, if they realize that God has given them gifts and talents and abilities, if they use those gifts they can make a huge impact. It's just believing that we can make a difference. So I think that's an element in helping uh, the people that need help in the world. It's a matter of evaluation. I guess that God looks at our heart and says of each of us, how honest is this person? Is he simply going to hound tradition for the sake of his own reputation, his own salary perhaps even? Or is he prepared to go with the truth at all costs? So we're on the test here. Once these ideas are presented to us, we are obliged to make something of it. The worst thing is for us simply to say, well, the church has always taught this. It's not even true. So they should become informed. Uh, you remember that Paul said of the Jews, they have a zeal for, knowledge, for God. They have a zeal for God, his fellow Israelites, but not according to knowledge. We need then to be zealous for the right knowledge also. And we're suggesting, and of course, we're not inventing anything here. We're simply processing in, in the early part of this century what has been around for years which in our day though has enormous confirmation from leading scholars. In our book, The Doctrine of the Trinity, Christianity's Self-Inflicted Wound, which is not meant to be a damaging title, but simply to alert people to the problem, in that book we've quoted scholars of various nationalities, of various ages, all of whom have uh, conspired in their various ways, conspired is the wrong word, but have, have contributed to the arguments and, uh, which show that 
the Trinitarian dogma is highly problematic and very likely not biblical at all. There's lots of documentation. We invite all of our audience, of course, to examine that evidence and see what they find for themselves. That's the best we can do. I think simply that people would have the time and the inclination and enough love for God and, uh, and for the Bible and for Jesus himself to study this issue. To be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11 where Paul preached to them briefly. And rather than taking Paul at his word without questioning, he says that they searched the scriptures daily. They had only an Old Testament at that point. We today have the whole canon of scripture, which is the uh, inspired word of God. And that people would take time to sit down, perhaps turn off the television, and give up a bit on entertainment and engage this very fascinating issue which has been one of the most monolithic struggles ever in the history of humankind. Jesus, a messenger of the good news of God, is still misunderstood to have been God himself. As unpersuasive as the traditional Trinitarian defense is, the vice grip of tradition continues to hold sway over the minds of believers everywhere, leaving the apparent truth about Jesus' humanity in a shadow. While hundreds of millions of Jews and Muslims seem willing to consider more closely the true historical Jesus who did not claim to be God, those religions remain theologically removed from Christianity by an orthodoxy which demands that all must accept a divine Jesus and a triune God. Does scripture present Jesus as a God-man? Or does scripture present a human Jesus? who is the mediator between all mankind and the one true God. When the opportunity presents itself, should we choose to hang on to tradition or to chase truth, no matter what the truth may be? So, what do you choose? I am the root and offspring of David, the bright. Genesis, all the way through to Revelation, is always of the human family. And what that means for us, and eternity, is to be with him. And say, these are the ones that are with him, because he gives his father the crown, and God becomes all of You're going to fun editing all this stuff, my goodness. Oh, yeah. What a nightmare. <laughs> is it all right? I mean, is it, is it, am I too quick or are we okay? Oh, no, no, all we're right. good, we're good. That sounds good. Very good. Good. For further reading on this subject, consider When Jesus Became God by Richard Rubinstein. Misquoting Jesus, Bart Ehrman. The Doctrine of the Trinity, Christianity's Self-Inflicted Wound by Anthony F. Buzzard and Charles F. Hunting. Divine Truth or Human Tradition by Patrick Navas Michael Servetus by M. Hiller and Claire Allen Out of the Flames by Lawrence and Nancy Goldstone Also online visit biblicalunitarian.com servetus.org restorationfellowship.org forone-god.net Godword.org and thehumanjesus.com. I, I go. I'm not about religion. I'm about relationship with the Father. Yes. And in the Bible, it says there's one mediator between between God and man. And uh, and it says, uh, you know, it talks about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit being one 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 Trinity, one God. And uh, that's that's what I believe. Okay. Uh, would you say that the Son is the same person as the Father? Is he the same person as the Father, the Son? Jesus is the Son of God, clearly. In the Bible. I would, I would say that the Son, the Son is the, si, si, yeah, the Son is the same as the Father. Um, the Holy Spirit um, is all in one, and and you know what? There's 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 a there's a thing of faith that you have to believe. You know, faith is being sure of what you hope for, and certain of the things which are unseen. Yeah. So. You know, I mean, a lot of people are like, I can't grasp that. Well, not everything was made to grasp. God's, God's infinite wisdom and His, 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 his understanding is, is unfathomable. And there are some things that we just need to kind of, you know, say, all right, you know what, I'm going to take a leap of faith and I'm going to trust in God, you know, to take care of